Today's video is sponsored by MyHeritage, the leading global service for family history research and DNA testing. MyHeritage is the number one family history service in Europe, putting more than 16 billion records right at your fingertips. Whether you're the family historian or know absolutely nothing about your family tree, MyHeritage puts you in the driver's seat to tell the story of you. Now, we got MyHeritage as a sponsor, and so I dove into my own family tree and found out all sorts of cool stuff that I'm going to tell you about. Firstly, my mother, she's got a German sounding surname, which I'm not going to tell you because it's always the question when you phone up to your bank, like, what's your mother's maiden name? But I managed to trace that family line all the way back to the 1850s, where my first relative emigrated from Germany. Good old Wilhelm, my great 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 grandpappy. On another side of the tree, a little bit more close to the present, there was my great granddad's records from the RAF, this is the Royal Air Force, when he was a pilot in the First World War. There's even this photo of him. It's super low resolution, but it's still cool. There's my great-great-granddad as a great-granddad? Great-granddad as a young man. And then there's someone else in my family who has five middle names. Possibly the most British thing about me. So look, I had a great time getting into all of this. My family tree is now sprawling. <laughs> you just click on it. You click research this person. You make all these links. It's very addictive and it's very fun. And there's also lots of cool elements that I didn't even mention yet, like how my heritage can colorize old family photos, especially if you're over here in Europe with me, you definitely want to check this out. Right now, you guys can sign up for a 14-day free trial and enjoy all of the amazing features that my heritage has to offer. If you decide to continue your subscription, you'll get a 50% discount. Just click the link in the description box below to get started. And now today's video. It was summer 2005 when scientists working in NASA got a once-in-a-career surprise. At the time, the space agency's flagship mission was Cassini, a probe that had recently entered orbit around Saturn and was now exploring the local system. Already it had uncovered secrets of the vast moon Titan and interacted with Saturn's famous rings. But it would be what Cassini found at a little-known satellite that sent NASA into shock that upended everything we thought we knew about space exploration. While casually passing the sixth largest Saturnian moon, Enceladus, the probe spotted something no one had predicted. Water. Gigantic plumes, spraying H2O and complex organic chemicals out into space. And that could only mean one thing. This tiny, long-ignored moon was home to a subsurface ocean theoretically capable of supporting life. In the years after Cassini's first groundbreaking flyby, the probe returned multiple times, painting a complex picture of this strange and distant world. With NASA planning a follow-up mission that may begin work this decade, now seems like the perfect time for a geographic's deep dive into Enceladus, the icy moon that may be home to alien life. In terms of natural satellites, there's no other planet in our solar system as blessed with riches as Saturn. As of spring 2022, scientists think there are 82 moons orbiting the seventh planet, dancing around its rings in a great cosmic ballet. Some of these are famous in their own right, like Titan waltzing along with a grace that belies its gigantic size, or Mimas with its giant crater that makes it look impressively like the Death Star. But while all of these objects are interesting in their own way, there's only one Saturnian satellite astrobiologists get goose flesh thinking about. One small moon that, as it twists through space, occupies a permanent corner of their hearts. The name of that tiny dancer? Enceladus. The sixth smallest of Saturn's natural satellites, Enceladus has a diameter of only 500 kilometers and a mass almost 700 times smaller than that of our moon. If that sounds a bit abstract, just picture Arizona on a map. You see those borders? Well, Enceladus's width could just about fit in there. Our moon's width, by contrast, would cover the entire continental United States. Saturn's biggest moon, Titan, would cover even more. So Enceladus is hardly big enough to stand out. If you just glanced it through a telescope, as humanity did for decades, you'd hardly give it a second thought. But like Tyrion Lannister, what Enceladus lacks in size, it more than makes up for in being utterly badass. The first fascinating thing about this moon is that it's the most reflective body in the solar system. Thanks to its white surface, Enceladus reflects back nearly 100% of light that falls on it. Now you sometimes go out on a clear night and our moon seems eerily bright. Well, it's doing that while only reflecting about 12% of the sun's rays. Stick Enceladus up in our night sky and the moon would appear like an old and grimy light bulb. This reflectiveness also makes its surface bone-chillingly cold. Even in sunlight, Enceladus shivers 
at a ghastly minus 201 degrees Celsius. Yet all this is just a sideshow, because it's what makes Enceladus so reflective that's truly interesting. The moon's surface is made up of water ice, something it has in common with other bodies in the solar system. But just being made of ice isn't enough to make something reflective. At the same time spans Enceladus is thought to have existed for, any inert white surface should have ceased to be white long ago, dulled by an accumulation of impacts and particles. That it still looks pristine means there must be geological processes going on, something that causes the surface to be periodically renewed, something that causes the strange grooves and fresh ice boulders around its south pole, something like a subsurface ocean. It's here that we start to see why NASA deems Enceladus worthy of future explorations. At such a diminutive size, Saturn's tiny moon shouldn't contain any liquid. Any heat left over from its formation should have long ago dispersed, leaving only a solid chunk of ice. Now, there are different theories as to why this didn't happen, but the most plausible hands credit to its neighbors. At a distance of 231,000 kilometers from Saturn, Enceladus orbits between the other moons Mimas and Tethys. Significantly, it also orbits in resonance with Saturn's second densest moon, Dione. Orbital resonance is when moons orbit a planet at different speeds, meaning they frequently pass each other by. For every time Dion lumbers around Saturn, plucky little Enceladus circles it twice. This means the bigger moon's gravity tugs on Enceladus, pulling it just a little. This push and pull between Dion and Saturn causes Enceladus's crust to stretch and deform, creating friction. This friction creates enough heat to keep the interior from freezing solid. It's a similar mechanism that's thought to keep the subsurface ocean of Jupiter's moon Europa liquid. Yet Enceladus's ocean is even more fascinating than Europa's. The reason? It doesn't stay entirely subsurface. At the moon's south pole, water escapes from the interior into a continental rush, a geyser of ice particles and gas eternally spraying into space. It's this geyser that forms Saturn's E-ring, a band of reflective particles trailing out in Enceladus's wake, forever replenished by the hidden ocean. But the coolest part involves Enceladus's surface. Because not all ice particles manage to escape into space, many wind up falling back onto the moon like snow. This is why Enceladus is so reflective, because its pristine surface is eternally being topped up by frozen water from its interior, an attribute utterly unique in our solar system. Yet it's only been comparatively recently that we discovered just how unusual Enceladus is. Remarkably, we only did so by sheer fluke. In the late 18th century, one name in astronomy towered above all others. William Herschel is today famous for not only discovering the first new planet since antiquity, but then having to deal with the scientific community, giving it a name that sounds like a part of your butt. Yet while Herschel would forever after be linked to cheap jokes, his achievements didn't end with gazing lovingly at Uranus. In August 1789, the great astronomer trained his telescope on the distant world of Saturn. On the 28th of that month, he became the first person in history to set eyes on Enceladus. It was not a particularly auspicious start. While Herschel's discovery was a breakthrough, it didn't attract much attention beyond the most die-hard astronomy fans. Saturn's sixth moon was simply too small, too uninteresting for the general public. It didn't even get its own name until 1847, when Herschel's son proposed a mythological naming system for Saturn's satellites. In fact, for most of the two centuries after Herschel spotted it, almost nothing was known about Enceladus. And to be honest, really few people cared. So far away from the sun, Enceladus was sure to be a dead world, a lifeless ball of ice silently passing through the darkness, barely worth a second thought. It was only as the 200th anniversary of its discovery approached that scientists began to wake up to the fascinating reality. In 1981, Voyager 2 passed through the Saturnian system on its epic journey, revealing some of its secrets for the first time. While it was the data on Saturn itself and the giant moon Titan that caused the most excitement, people couldn't help but notice there was something unusual about Enceladus too. Contrary to expectations, the moon's surface was smooth, with only a few pockmarks left by meteor strikes. It was also remarkably white, suggesting some unknown process must be refreshing it over and over again. Still tantalizing though this was, it wasn't enough to attract much attention. When NASA and the European Space Agency began to work on their joint mission to the Saturnian system, it wasn't so that they could get closer to Enceladus. No, 
The interest lay in the gas giant itself, its rings, and in the vast, complex moon Titan. While the Cassini probe they eventually built was designed to visit Enceladus, it would just be a quick flyby, a courtesy call similar to what other moons like Phoebe would also receive. At this stage, no one could have guessed that Enceladus would become one of the mission's most enduring accomplishments. Cassini blasted off from Florida in 1997, finally reaching the Saturnian system in 2004. While the whole mission was arguably one of the most groundbreaking in history and probably deserves its own video on one of my other channels, it was what happened in 2005 that really changed everything. After getting an odd reading on Cassini's magnetometer, scientists determined that Enceladus was interacting strangely with Saturn's magnetic field. So they sent the probe in for a proper flyby, wondering if they might discover a thin atmosphere. Instead, they went to something that should have been impossible. On July the 13th, 2005, Cassini detected a huge cloud of water vapor over Enceladus's south pole. Shortly after, it transmitted back the first images of the great water plumes spraying into space. For people at NASA, this was a little like URA opening a parcel expecting to find a new book and instead finding the Ark of the Covenant. There was scientific pandemonium. The entire Cassini mission was rejigged to perform more flybys of Enceladus, including a 2008 swoop right through the plumes themselves. Over the course of about 20 close encounters, NASA would collect reams of data on this little moon, data that pointed to something as amazing as it was unexpected, that Enceladus might just house the perfect environment to support alien life. Pop quiz! What do you picture when you hear the names Alexandria, Baghdad, Cairo, and Damascus? If you're a normal person, you probably answer something along the lines of cities in the Middle East. If you're a space nerd, though, you're likely already whispered to yourself with a smug smile, Tiger Stripes. But these aren't the kind of tiger stripes that zoologists are used to. Lying at Enceladus's south pole, tiger stripes are the name for four gigantic parallel fissures spaced roughly 32 kilometers apart. Named after locations from the 1001 Nights, it's from deep within their hearts that the fountains of Enceladus emerge. Exactly how they formed remains a mystery, although several research papers have advanced theories over the last couple of years. The important point, though, is that they exist and they are stunning. The makeup of the plumes they're expelling alone is enough to get excited about. A combination of water, vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and a few other elements, the plumes also carry organic materials, 20 times more than scientists initially predicted. On top of that, there's also the presence of a specific type of silica, one that can only come about by introducing liquid water and rock at temperatures over 90 Celsius. Taken together, all of this has some fascinating implications for Enceladus's hidden ocean. Only confirmed by Cassini data in 2014, this ocean likely sits below ice up to 25 kilometers thick, although perhaps as little as 1 to 5 kilometers thick at the South Pole. Down here, there is no daylight, only a primordial darkness, a vast ocean of night plunging to depths of 13 kilometers deeper even than the Mariana Trench. Like our seas, the water should be salty, a briny mixture that prevents it from freezing. Yet, even down here, uh, there would be heat. Remember all that talk of Enceladus being in orbital resonance with another moon? Well, that tugging and friction could well have given rise to things like hydrothermal vents on the sea floor, out of which interior heat would flow into the lightless sea. This is the most likely explanation for those weird particles of silica Cassini detected in the plumes. Deep sea vents, just like we find here on Earth. Of course, the exact nature of Enceladus's interior is a mystery to us. We know the subsurface ocean exists thanks to some very fancy gravity measurements, but what actually causes the heating and what processes are taking place involves more guesswork. Still, the guesses we can make paint a picture of a truly alien world. On planet Earth, the further under sea you go, the colder it tends to get as less and less sunlight filters down. On Enceladus, the opposite likely happens. The seafloor may be relatively warm, while the water in contact with the ice crust is as chilly as hell. But even this upside downness might not be the most alien thing about this remarkable moon. No, that might be the aliens themselves, not aliens in the sense of E.T. or the Xenomorph, but the possibility of real living microbes that evolved independently of all life on Earth inhabiting a sunless ocean some 1.2 billion kilometers away is a real thing. So after three whole chapters of build-up, let's dig into the best part of all of these space videos. The part where we consider the very real possibility that we are not alone.
It wasn't all that long ago that claiming alien life could exist within our solar system would get you labeled a mouth-breathing crackpot who never got over the cancellation of the X-Files. But not today. Today, astrobiologists have identified numerous worlds we could reasonably send probes to that might harbor microbial creatures. Today, NASA is willing to spend billions of dollars on flagship missions such as Mars Sample Return or the Europa Clipper looking for evidence of non-terrestrial life forms. Evidently, a lot has changed in a short period, and there's a clear reason for this. The more we investigate our solar system's moons and dwarf planets, the more evidence we find of subsurface water in the form of briny reservoirs or entire oceans. And where we find water on Earth, we almost always find life. Now, that's not to say the hidden pools and seas of Europa or Ceres or Pluto necessarily hold living things. If you've got a secret fantasy of one day swimming with funky space dolphins, you should be aware that bitter disappointment probably awaits. It could be that these ocean worlds are as dead and as silent as space itself. That being said, there are good reasons to think that if life does exist anywhere in our solar system, Enceladus might be one of the likeliest places to find it. To understand why, we need to bear two factors in mind, hydrothermal vents and methane. We'll tackle the vents first. On Earth, hydrothermal vents are considered prime candidates for where life began. So abundant are the microbes around them. In part, this is due to a process known as serpentization, a fancy way of saying hot water reacts with a mineral-rich crust, creating specific kinds of chemicals, chemicals that help form the structure of the vents themselves, concentrating organic materials, the stuff that could be necessary to kickstart life. But if possible deep-sea vents were all we had to go on, people wouldn't be quite so excited about Enceladus. No, enthusiasm for Saturn's sixth moon has to do with liquid water, hydrothermal vents, and also methane. When Cassini flew through Enceladus's plumes at a height of 48 kilometers, it detected, among other things, hydrogen and methane. This was exciting, because hydrogen could be produced by deep sea vents, while methane could be produced by microbes which feast on that same hydrogen. Known as methanogens, these little guys are found at undersea vents here on Earth. They're picking out and all that delicious hydrogen and CO2, and they're pooping out CH4. Now, an abundance of methane in and of itself doesn't mean it comes from lots of tiny alien farts. There are many non-organic processes that can result in methane, not least serpentization itself. But some recent studies have run the numbers and concluded that there's just too much methane coming out of Enceladus's tiger stripes to be the result of any known natural processes. Which hints ever so slightly toward a whole bunch of alien microbes being behind it. However, we shouldn't get too carried away declaring the discovery of extraterrestrial life. There could be an entirely unknown natural process at work on Enceladus creating this methane. In fact, one theory is that the moon formed from multiple comet collisions. If that's the case, its interior would be full of minerals capable of generating good old CH4 and also ruining all of our fun. Still, Cassini revealed enough about Enceladus to make plenty of very clever people think that we should go back and explore it as soon as possible, this time with a probe specifically designed to hunt for clear signs of living organisms. Luckily, it now seems that that opportunity might be just around the corner. Every 10 years since 2002, NASA has asked planetary scientists to collaborate on something known as the Decadal Survey. An overview of possible future missions the agency should divert resources towards, the survey is often key to getting a mission funded, showing that this is what the best in field think we should be working on. It was the results of the 2002 survey that led to NASA funding the New Horizons probe to Pluto, the 2012 results that led to the Ingenuity helicopter on Mars, and the upcoming Europe Europa Clipper mission to Jupiter's icy moon. And speaking of Europa, if you watched our video on the subject, you may recall that we ended on a mild cliffhanger. At the time, the 2022 Decadal Survey was coming up, and we were rooting for it to recommend a proposed lander probe that would drill into Europa's ice and look for signs of life. So when the survey results were released in April 2022, it was a bit of a bittersweet moment for us. Bitter because the Europa lander was deprioritized, with the Clipper mission already scheduled for multiple flybys, scientists evidently thought that that was enough. And sweet, because the survey instead awarded the second place slot to another mission to an icy moon with a subsurface ocean. Care to guess what that moon was called? The Enceladus Orbalander is a geek's wet dream made 
flesh. A combined orbiter and lander probe, it will first circle the Saturnian moon for around 200 days, repeatedly flying through the plumes to analyze the chemical composition. Admittedly, Cassini already did this, but Cassini wasn't built for such a mission and was extremely limited in the measurements it could take. The Orbilander, by contrast, will be equipped with instruments specifically designed to detect signs of life. Cool as this is, though, it's what comes next that's really awesome. While orbiting Enceladus, the probe will make extremely detailed maps of the South Pole around the Tiger Stripes. Using this data, scientists will choose a suitable landing site. And then the nail-biting part begins. Flipping on its side, the plan is to have the Orbilander descend onto Enceladus' surface. Once on the ice, two nuclear sources would keep it active for perhaps 18 months as it digs through the fresh snow in search of things like amino acids, lipids, or even cellular life forms. Equipped with a DNA sequencer, it will be able to tell us almost everything there is to know about whatever it might find. In short, this is an insanely ambitious mission, so ambitious that it sadly won't happen for a long time yet. The current schedule envisages work beginning at the end of this decade with a projected launch date of 2038. That means the Orbilander won't arrive at Enceladus until 2050, by which point I'll be old enough to have started the Retirement Graphics channel. And that's only if it actually goes ahead. While most of the decadal survey's highest priorities do get funded, they certainly aren't cheap. The Enceladus Orbilander is projected to cost between three and five billion dollars from NASA's planetary science budget. And with the 2022 survey's main priority being a mission to the Uranian system, the Orbilander's future relies heavily on the goodwill of Congress to keep funding increasingly expensive projects on the understanding that this knowledge will benefit us all. Still, we don't want to end this video on a down note, not when an extremely exciting future lies ahead of us. Since we started adding these space videos to our geographics lineup, it's become almost a cliche for them to end with a hopeful comment about the future, about some great new project humanity has in the works and the scientific wonders that await us. But that's only because we really are standing on the threshold of an exciting new era. The next three decades are set to see an intense exploration of ocean worlds, both current and former, as NASA prioritizes the search for alien life. Right now, there are rovers exploring ancient riverbeds on Mars, scouring rocks for traces of long-extinct microorganisms. Scientists at NASA are building probes that will soon fly to Europa and Titan. Research teams are preparing sample return missions to Ceres. The Enceladus Orbilander, then, isn't a one-off. Rather, it can be seen as the climax, the pinnacle of all of this exploration, and just maybe the one with the greatest chance of success. So if these videos often end on an excited note, it's because, clearly, there's a lot to be excited about. A chance that, in the near future, we will answer one of the most profound questions of all. Are we alone in the universe? Now, that answer may just lie in the plumes of a distant, tiny moon orbiting Saturn. A small, icy world known as Enceladus.